Take your Bibles and turn with me to Nehemiah chapter 8. Nehemiah 8. This morning we are continuing our series titled Anticipating God in 2020. As you may be aware about this book, Nehemiah carries a very strong connection uh, with the book that immediately precedes it, the book of Ezra. And in fact, some Jewish traditions consider these two books to be two parts of a single volume. And as we're going to see in the text today, the Lord's used, He uses both of these men, Ezra and Nehemiah, working side by side in a complementary kind of fashion to help bring about the restoration of Jerusalem that, that was so necessary after the Jewish Babylonian captivity and the subsequent return of the exiles. This is a time period in redemptive history that we are not 100% as familiar with as maybe some other time periods. But there is much rich fruit to glean from these books. And so with that in mind, let's dive in together and read together. Nehemiah chapter 8, verses 1 to 12. This is God's holy an inspired word speaking to us today. And all the people gathered as one man into the square before the water gate. They told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had commanded Israel. So Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, both men and women and all who could understand what they heard on the first day of the seventh month. And he read from it facing the square before the water gate from early morning until midday in the presence of the men and the women and those who could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. And Ezra the scribe stood on a wooden platform that had been made for the purpose. And beside him stood Mattathiah, Shema, Ananiah, Uriah, Hilkiah, Messiah on his right hand, and Padiah, Mishael, Barkaja, Hashem, Hashbadana, Zechariah, and Mishalom on his left hand. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people. And as he opened it, all the people stood. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting up their hands. And they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Also Jeshua, Bani, Sarabiah, Jabin, Echab, Shabbatai, Hodiah, Maseah, Kaliah, Kaliah, Azariah, Josabad, Hanan, Kaliah, the Levites, helped the people to understand the law while the people remained in their places. They read from the book, from the law of God clearly, and they gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra, the priest, and scribe, and the Levites, who taught the people, said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep, for all the people wept as they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, Go your way. Eat the fat, and drink sweet wine, and send portions to anyone who has nothing ready. For this day is holy to our Lord. And do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites called all the people, saying, Be quiet, for this day is holy. Do not be grieved. And all the people went their way to eat and drink and to send portions and to make great rejoicing, because they had understood the words that were declared to them. May the Lord... Do this same thing in our midst this morning. One January evening, almost exactly 12 years ago now, a large group of conference attendees, they gathered in a downtown convention center right in the heart of San Francisco. And they were eager to hear what was at the time a highly anticipated keynote from the conference's world-famous speaker. The weeks and the months that had been leading up to the conference, there had been a lot of rampant speculation, a lot of buzz in the media as to what this man was going to talk about, what he was going to reveal during his speech. And so as the presenter stepped out onto the stage, there was a hush that kind of fell over this large crowd. They leaned in, 
They don't want to miss a single part of his opening remarks. And he began with this declaration. This is a day I've been looking forward to for two and a half years. Every once in a while, a revolutionary product comes along that changes everything. And with these words, one Steve Jobs went on to unveil the very first iPhone, a device that he claimed would eventually reinvent the phone. And in short order, Apple, as you know, not only reinvented the phone, they literally changed the world. Well, that evening in San Francisco, as awaited and as monumental as it was, it pales in comparison to this gathering that we just read about this morning. And here's why. Here's why it pales. Because even as great a visionary as a guy like Steve Jobs was, and he was a great visionary, he was still human. He was still a man. And there's only one speaker. There's only one person who can address us whose voice is powerful enough to bring life. There's only one speaker. There's only one person that we can gather, who we can listen to, whose voice is powerful enough to bring us life. And it just so happens that that one speaker is who takes center stage in our text today. So let's dive into that. Let's dive in and, and explore that. The passage, it breaks down into two parts. And that's going to serve as our structure this morning. There's two parts to this. The first section is in verses 1 to 8. It's this anticipated gathering. The anticipated gathering. That's in the first eight verses. The second section that we're going to look at is the unexpected unveiling. It's in verses 9 to 12. The unexpected unveiling. So let's look at that first part together. The anticipated gathering. Anticipation for a gathering should reflect the one that we're gathering to hear. That's, that's right off the bat what we see in verse 1. We're dropped into this energetic scene that's going on in Jerusalem. All the people from the surrounding towns have packed their way into the city for this special day. They've come for, for, to, to this water gate, this plaza that's right in front of the water gate. It's a standing room only event. And they probably gathered here because this is the only part of town where everybody could get in. They didn't want to leave anybody outside. So they've packed their way in, and nobody's been excluded from this gathering. And the narrator, he's making sure that we know that this thing is happening uh, on the first day of the seventh month. And so what that would have marked is the, the new year, the Jewish new year. That would have marked the beginning of a new season for them. And so this is what, similar to what we celebrated this past week. Uh, this day, it would have signified clearly, even on their calendar, a new beginning. And yet, this is no ordinary new year. This is no ordinary new year. It, it's truly a remarkable new, new beginning, one that's been nearly two, 150 years in the making. You see, Jerusalem, Jerusalem was supposed to have served as the focal point for these kinds of gatherings on an annual basis. It was supposed to be, it was supposed to be the place where God's people came together before Him. And yet, tragically, when the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, had marched on the city in 586 B.C., the city had been reduced, literally, to a forsaken and defenseless smoldering pile of rubble. That's what was left of this glorious city. And it had continued in that ruined state for decades. It had been that situation for years. And finally, until the Babylonians fell to the Persians... And Cyrus, the Persian king, he made a declaration, and he said, for all the Jews that want to go back and begin rebuilding this temple, he makes a declaration and, and, and sends them to be, go back and to begin rebuilding their temple. Historians are split as to the motivation behind his decree, but many believe it was for political reasons. But nonetheless, the Old Testament makes it a point over and over in countless places to make sure that we understand that God was ultimately behind that. No matter what Cyrus's reasons were, ultimately God was behind that. He was the one ensuring that the people of Jerusalem could miraculously return to their homes. And then after the temple was finished, the Lord raises up Ezra to bring a second wave. And then finally, Nehemiah to continue the city's reformation. Nehemiah brings a third wave of exiles back. And he brings specifically for this purpose, to begin rebuilding the walls of a city, to begin reestablishing a defense, a perimeter, a place where they could have a safe haven. And despite 
facing intense opposition, which he did. You, you can read about that in the first six chapters. There was intense opposition from outside forces. His own ranks, there was disunity that they experienced. Despite all of that, the project was finally completed. And the author has carefully ordered the sequence of events in this book to help us understand the goal of that. Everything that came before it, the first six chapters that we read about, he wants us to know that the people gathering here to help begin renewing the covenant in Jerusalem, that was the point of all that had come before it. The walls were not the point. This was. They were a means to an end. They weren't the goal. So the people haven't so much gathered as they've been brought. You see, Cyrus and Ezra and Nehemiah, they had acted, but God had directed. He's the one who brought them back. And even the most powerful empire in world history, even the most powerful empire in world history was not enough to stop God's faithfulness to His people. He's the one that's behind this gathering. Behind it all, everything that went into it, He's behind it. And so in every sense, this is a supernatural gathering. And the people recognize that. They recognize it for what it is, because here's what they do in the beginning of verse 1. You see that? They gather to hear the Word. They told Ezra the scribe, bring the book of the law. That's what they asked for. We came came to hear God speak. Bring the book of the law. And so Ezra the priest brings this book before the assembly. Men, women, all who could understand. Most likely the reading that he begins reading would include books like Genesis and Exodus all the way through Deuteronomy, but there's possible some wisdom literature was included in that as well. And clearly Ezra leaves nothing out because we see that as he starts reading, he begins in the very beginning of the morning and he goes until midday, five plus hours he's been reading. But the people don't seem so worried about the clock on this day. They're caught up. They're enraptured in what they're hearing. And then we see in verse 3 that all the ears of the people were attentive to the book of the law. They are receiving the words of Scripture. They're receiving the words of Scripture as genuinely being God's very own words to them. And so when verse 5 opens with the phrase, Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people. This is a statement that's loaded with meaning. It's loaded with meaning. Yes, that's physically what actually happened. That's what what he did. But with men standing on both sides of him and the people leaning in, this phrase is also carrying the full weight of God's saving power. God himself is addressing them. His glory is there in the midst of His gathered people. And that's why we see Ezra bless the Lord in front of the people. That's why he's called the great God. He blesses the great God, the Lord. And why the people bow down in worship. And and why they wholeheartedly agree by saying amen and amen in response to what they hear. God has acted to rescue His people. He has given them a collective identity, and now He is bringing them here into this place to address them as their God. This is a pattern that we find over and over and over again throughout Scripture. By nature, God is a God who communes with and communicates to His people. He always has. God rescues, God gathers, and God speaks. That's the pattern. God rescues, God gathers, and God speaks. This is the, one of the main things In the Old Testament, as you read through the Old Testament, it's one of the main things that's going to distinguish, that's going to mark the true and living God from every other false God in the ancient Near East. He speaks. The true God speaks. The false gods cannot. And it's something that His people should anticipate. It's something they should anticipate. And notice in verses 7 and 8 that there's often a specific means that He uses to accomplish this work. To speak to his people. There's a specific means that we and we see it here. You see in verse seven and eight, there's this list of all these, these folks that are there, the Levites. And they're helping the people to understand the law. They read from the book of the law clearly. See that in verse eight? And then they give the sense so that the people understood the reading. 
Remember, this scene is it's happening hundreds of years after these books had been written. It's possible that many of those who had gathered in the city that day, they, they may not have even been able to read Hebrew script at this point. Aramaic was the language of their captives, captors. So it's possible that even reading it would have been a challenge for a lot of the people there. And so even though they're in our texts, in many ways, this morning, they're sitting in our seat. They aren't the original audience of what they're hearing. And they need God's Word explained and open to them as well. And notice that it's through the gathering, it's through the gathering of God's people that they gain greater access to His Word. It's probably not the first time that they've heard the book of the law. The difference is that now they're understanding it rightly. They may not understand it exhaustively, but they're understanding it clearly. They may not know that all that it means, but they know what it means. See, even though they had come with an expectancy, it's through this time of sitting under God's Word, of having it opened before them, that an unveiling starts to happen. An unveiling that transforms Everything. That leads us to this second section in verses 9 to 12, the unexpected unveiling. Here in verse 9, we see an awareness starting to dawn on God's people. Look at that with me. It says, And Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra the priest, and scribe, and the Levites who taught the people, said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep, for all the people wept as they heard the words of of the law. As the priests clearly explain the book of the law, the people become increasingly distraught over their sin. There's this visible response that's similar to many other moments in the Old Testament when God shows up in the assembly of His people. And on this occasion, hearing God's perfect law doesn't bring the people comfort. Instead, it's beginning to serve as a mirror on their own lives. It's beginning to show them their true condition. You see, as long as they were comparing themselves to the Persians and to the Babylonians, their lives looked relatively faithful. But here, standing in front of this covenant, God's standard, it's beginning to reveal how far short of that they have fallen. And it's so overwhelming that they literally begin to start weeping out loud. They're not caring about what the person beside them thinks of them or what the tomorrow may bring. Right now, in this moment, This is the awareness that's breaking into their life. They've experienced the humiliation possibly of being captives before. But now they're undone by a sort of spiritual humiliation. As much as they had felt hopelessness along the way, now they're beginning to realize just how truly hopeless things really are for them. Under the covenant of Sinai, God had promised to be their God. He had promised to dwell with them. He had promised to bless them. But the people were called to walk in faithfulness to this God who was blessing them. They were called to keep His laws. And now they're beginning to understand they have failed that covenant at every turn. That's what's dawning on them. What right do we have to call the Lord our God anymore? How can we pray to Him and expect to find His help waiting? How can we even begin to repay? How can we even begin to make this right? What do you do? Where do you turn? Many of you work in the world of contracts, and even if you don't, you're familiar with how binding they can be. The words on the page mean something. You can't agree to certain terms and then break your part of the deal. And even if somehow you're able to talk your way back into the good graces so this contract is still standing somehow, if you don't hold up your end of the bargain a second time, that's it. The relationship's over. There's no expectation. You're not getting another chance. And that stands for a contract that's technically between two equals, between two people. Well, this covenant is between a party that rules over heaven and earth 
and a people who are dependent upon him for literally their everything, for their crops, for their protection, and finally for their salvation. And now it's becoming real that they and the generations that have come before them have broken this covenant over and over and over. And it begins to dawn. There's no hope for a people like that. You don't get another chance. You don't get a do-over. The relationship is done. It's broken. God has been patient. He's been kind. He's been merciful every single time. But now they're beginning to realize he would be 100% within his rights to end it right here. They have nowhere else to turn. There aren't loopholes. There aren't technicalities. The only reasonable expectation left is to face the just penalty of our sin. That's what they're beginning to understand. That's all we have to look forward to. The prosecution rests its case. You see, God's Word is not primarily intended to have an intellectual effect only on its hearers. It must have that effect on us. It includes that. But the effect of rightly understanding Scripture is primarily a spiritual effect. It ushers us into God's presence in a way that nothing else ever will. And when it does that, it begins to show us His glory and what He's like and His expectations and His standards. And what it does is it shows how far short we are. The effect that it had on the crowd is the intended effect of Scripture in our lives. It's a spiritual effect. We've got to picture the scene. We've got to kind of put ourselves in it. Here we are, as best we can tell, ruined in every sense of the word. Owing a debt that can never be repaid. Literally weeping out loud. At the end of the road, with no hope and zero ex- options, zero expectations. Can you start to feel just a little bit of the tightness that those kinds of situations bring into your life. You ever ever face one of those? It's that tightness of, I, I have no idea what to do. I don't have anywhere to turn. That feeling of hopelessness in the pit of your stomach. That's what these folks are experiencing as they see God's law revealed to them, as they understand it. Where do we go? But then notice what comes next. Nehemiah tells them to quiet down. He has something to say. And listen to what he says in verse 10. In response to that. Then he said to them, go your way. Eat the fat and drink sweet wine and send portions to anyone who has nothing ready. For this day is holy to our Lord, and do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. How astounding is this? The very last thing that they would expect to hear. It's hard to even begin to wrap our minds around how sweet this would have sounded. The very last thing. You have to realize it's important to remember that feasting under the old covenant, it was a symbol of God's favor. It was, it was a way of saying it represented his blessing. It was a declaration of hope being spoken. If our God is for us, he still intends to do us good. So how do you start to process that in this moment? In the exact moment when you're finally becoming aware of the depths of your own sin and seeing that there's no way out, you're hearing, don't grieve. Instead, go out and party. Go out and party. I mean, shouldn't this be a moment? Wouldn't we expect a moment of somberness and sobriety here? Is this occasion to promise God that you're never going to do that again? You're not going to break His law anymore? Wouldn't trying to pay Him back in some way, wouldn't that be the appropriate response? Maybe going to a monastery and checking ourselves in so we can sit in private reflection and meditation. No, he says, eat the fat, drink the sweet wine, and not only do that, not only do that, do it together. Make sure that everybody has enough to celebrate with you. So how does that even start to work? I mean, is Nehemiah just sweeping sin under the rug here? Is he just ignoring it, saying, don't worry about it? It's 
Doesn't this sound like the epitome of cheap grace? But it's just possible. These men are seeing something that we too are meant to see this morning. And there's two phrases that tip off, that begin to tip us off to who's actually behind all of this lavish and shocking grace. Nehemiah hasn't gone rogue. He hasn't led the people astray. He's following God. Look at the first reason he gives them in verse 10 for why they should do these things. He says, you're to do these things for today is holy to our Lord. This is the Lord's day, and whatever he says is appropriate is actually the only appropriate response in this moment. Now get this straight. Now don't you stop grieving. You're instead supposed to go out and celebrate. And here's the reason why. For today is holy to the Lord. The command is shocking enough. The reason that he gives for the command is even more shocking. These people are anything but holy. That's the last thing that you would use to describe them. Instead of finding, but instead on this holy day, a day when it should be condemnation waiting for them, they discover something wonderful. God isn't like they are. He's different. He doesn't do what they assume that he would do. He doesn't do what any of them in his place would automatically do. He doesn't treat them as their sins deserve. He doesn't abandon them. And this holy God who knows the depths of their sins even more than they did, even more than they are aware in this moment, that holy God is the one who is bidding them to come to him and to find their joy in him, greater joy than they would have ever expected, beyond what they could imagine. This is the unexpected unveiling. It's grace. It's grace. When they are finally coming face to face with their sin, it's the very last thing they would have ever expected to find waiting for them on the other side. But what joy breaks in when we see it. Undeserved and unreserved grace poured out in an assembly that never thought to find it. That's when Nehemiah and Ezra helped the people to understand that the final life-giving word that God speaks to his people is this, grace. Grace. Look at verse 12. What a beautiful transformation starts to happen. Look at the overflowing joy that comes out of this verse. And all the people, the people who were just weeping two verses earlier, all the people went their way to eat and drink and to send portions and to make great rejoicing. Why? Because they had understood the words that were declared to them, the words of grace. They had come in carrying chains. They walked out free. They had bowed their heads in shame. They lifted them in celebration. They began with tears. They departed in laughter. They came in trembling, and they left dancing. That's what grace does when it's revealed in, to God's people. As it turned out, the unexpected unveiling was God. It was God. And He is the one who changes everything about us. So how do we as God's people today experience that same transforming, life-giving joy today? How do we as His people, as His church, how do we do that? Surely if God intended <coughs> for His people to find their joy in Him in the Old Testament. If that was the case, then surely, surely He intends for those of us right now, today, those of us in this room who are under the new covenant as a church, to experience it in even deeper ways. And notice that the pattern and the means that He uses to bring about that in our midst is eerily familiar. God rescues God gathers, and God speaks. It's eerily familiar. And while His people no longer gather in Jerusalem, 
to renew the old covenant. We still gather together expectantly under the new covenant. And we gather to encounter Him in His Word because we know that our God speaks. We gather to have our strength and our joy renewed in Him in ways that only He can. So as we start 2020, I would suggest three ways, three truths from this text that can begin to help shape our corporate identity as God's people in the new covenant. Three truths from this text that can begin to help us think and shape our corporate identity as God's people. First, consider the miracle, the miracle that Sunday represents for us. Consider the miracle that Sunday morning represents for us. Before this is a social gathering, before we come because it's just what we do, before we, it's an inspirational moment in our week, it's this, this gathering is supernatural. It's miraculous. And there's no way to consider the miracle of Sunday morning without considering the miracle of your own story. Think about it. None of us should be here. None of us should be here. None of us should be numbered among the people of God. Not one of us. We haven't earned that. People in this story had suffered the loss of their home along the way. And just like them, we've rightfully lost our home as well. In Adam, we too were carried off into the captivity. We too were led away by the chains of our own sin. We too have labored away under the oppressive rule of another kingdom. Scripture is clear that before Christ, all of us, every one of us, belong to the domain of darkness. We were following the prince of the power of the air. We were following the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. And all of us were by our very nature enemies of God. And enemies don't get invited in. They aren't numbered in the gathering. They're left outside. And yet, church, here we stand this morning, called together as saints. We bear the very name of Jesus Christ. He bids us and welcomes us to come in His name. Is this not a miracle? Is this not the work of God? Is it not He that brought us? He that gathered us? You'll see what God's hand looks like. Look around. Think about your own story. And look around. I wonder, I wonder if we consider the miracle of Sunday morning enough. Second, consider the power of God's Word in your life. I don't mean consider the power of God's Word generally, although that's important. I mean consider the power of God's Word in your life. We must include that last phrase. Listen, it's critical that we have right doctrine of the Word. We want to study and we want to teach things like divine inspiration and the sufficiency of Scripture. But those indispensable truths, they must serve a greater end. They must serve the greater end of bringing God's people, our lives, into greater submission to God's Word. Those truths about the nature of God's Word, both our lives, both privately and corporately. Although the Bible is going to have an intellectual effect on us, we want to think deeply about it. That can't be the primary effect of Scripture on us. The effect of rightly understanding Scripture is primarily a spiritual effect. It's the effect that Scripture had on this gathering. They may not have been able to articulate it the same way that we can today, but they were experiencing it nonetheless. 
Listen, we don't have we don't have a robust understanding of scripture if it isn't increasingly making an impact in our daily lives. The Bible is full of comfort for us. And yet it's not intended to make us comfortable. Scripture is God speaking to us. It's Him addressing us to change us and to transform us. So it's helpful to do some evaluation here. When is the last time that you were truly impacted when Scripture was opened? Whether that be in your personal devotions, whether that be in your small group as the adults gather to study, whether it be on a Sunday morning when we open the Word here. When is the last time? Has it been days? Has it been weeks? Has it been years? Do you even expect it to speak to you? Are you still open and leaning in when God's Word is open because of the one who is speaking? You want to know what the number one sign is that God is moving in our midst? It's when we as a people have a posture towards the Word of God as the Word of God. That means Scripture just can't have technical or theoretical authority over our lives. It must have functional authority over our lives. That gets into the nitty-gritty. It gets into the deep cracks. It gets into those parts of our lives that we just assume are off-limits. The doors that are bolted shut with as many locks as we can possibly have. And they, we intend for them to stay that way. The box that we've buried out back and we've covered it over and we've made sure stuff's regrown so that nobody even knows it's there. Those parts of our lives that everyone else needs to stay out of. Those parts. Where maybe we've even managed to convince ourselves we're okay there. That it's not that big a deal. That part of our lives. Those areas. Those areas are the areas that God's Word must be able to speak to. If God is the one who is speaking, then He must be able to address all of our lives. You know, it can be painful when He gets to those places, can it? As long as we're talking about this stuff over here, we're good. But when it gets close to this area, whatever it is, when it starts getting a little close to this area, it can be painful. And just like it did for these folks, you know what it does when it gets close to those areas in our lives? It evokes a response from us. It evokes a response from us. It's not always a pretty one. But functionally, functionally, that's what it means for Scripture to be God's Word to us. We come to lean in because of the one speaking, not because we've decided it's a safe topic that we're okay with. And we respond first because we know that He's addressing us, not because we think this should be for somebody else. I wonder if we consider the power of God's Word in our lives. But here's this beautiful picture of why in the world we would be willing to gather to do that. Because when we submit to the functional power, the functional authority of God's Word in our lives, and we let it get close to those areas, There's something wonderful that's waiting for us on the other side. And it's this third and final application point. Consider afresh. Consider the shock of God's grace towards you. Consider afresh the shock of God's grace towards you. Over the last few months, we've walked through different Old Testament narratives all along the way on anticipating God. And do you know what one of the surprising things, that, and it shouldn't have surprised me, but you know one of the surprising things that kept coming up over and over again? God's people ran into grace in moments where you just didn't see it coming. That's what you see over and over again. It's repeated. You know what it means when it's repeated? It means it's not to stay here in these pages. Church, on this side of the cross, we have even more reason to find grace waiting for us in these pages. That was the shock of of what they had experienced. We can see even more. We have even more reason to be expectant of that. And just as it happened in times of old, it's oftentimes, it's oftentimes in the places that we least expect to find it. 
You see, we purposely talk often about the gospel. We are intentionally a gospel-centered church. We always want to be that way. May the Lord make that always true of us. But even as we're rehearsing the good news of Jesus Christ and what He's done on our behalf, (coughs) even as we're rehearsing those things, we can't get over the absolute shock of it all. We can't get used to it. We can't let it become commonplace, something we've heard before. You see, the cross is the last place that we should ever expect to find God's kindness. This is the scene. This is the scene of the worst treason that humanity has ever committed. And even though we weren't physically there, we had blood on our hands. We were complicit. By all accounts, we should try to run as far from that place as we could possibly run because nothing should be waiting for us there but darkness and hopelessness and agony. And if the law exposed our rebellion against God, then the cross exposes our absolute hatred for God apart from Him. It should be the place where the great accuser of our souls can finally rest his case. What other evidence do I need to show? It's the crucifixion of Jesus. It's the most damning evidence of guilt there is, of our guilt. What else could be found to say about us that's worse? If your worst moment in life was on this screen right here, it wouldn't be as bad as this. It would pale It would look like a good work compared to this. The cross is the last place that we should expect to find God's kindness. It should not be safe for us. This is the place where we broke faith permanently. And yet it's here. It's here at this place where the true depths of our sin is exposed. It's here in this place where our God, who is still our God, beckons us to draw close to Him. It's the place where He longs to meet us. Here is where He has His look upon the death of His very own Son. And to see again and again and again that He is not like us. He does not treat us as our sins deserve. Here, where it should be the place that any hope of peace with God would have been utterly and completely ruined, where we should have ruined the whole thing, all of humanity should have ruined the whole thing, It's in that moment we hear him whisper, this day, this darkest night, the worst day, humanity's worst moment, this day is holy to the Lord. This day. instead of going to enjoy the fairest of food and drink. Now we hear the sweetest of invitations. Come. Eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. And here on the ground, as our tears flow, we're handed a cup as God's people, and we're told, drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. That's where they went this day. That's where they went on our best day, for the forgiveness of sins. I wonder if we consider the shock of grace enough. It's waiting for us in those places 
in those moments of our lives that we would least expect to find it. And oh, what happiness abounds when we see it. Church, that's why we gather on Sundays. That's why we come to this place and we get up. And we could sleep in or do laundry after holiday. That's why we come. Because we have every reason to come expectantly. To come to be addressed yet again by the one whose very voice brings life. To hear the true God who still speaks. But as we heard about this morning, we're also, and even in the midst of this, we're also just a picture. We're just a glimpse. Because see, there's a promised assembly that's coming. It's the one that all of history has been waiting for. It's the one that that day was waiting for. It's the one that this day is waiting for. And it's the glorious tomorrow. When all of God's people, people from every tribe and every tongue and every language and every nation are going to be gathered together, brought from the farthest places, from the darkest chambers, emerging from places that we would never have imagined, brought together, rescued, and gathered into a city that's finally finished. A city that was built just for this purpose. A city whose gates will always be open. And we're going to hear our Savior say, Do not grieve anymore. For the marriage feast of the Lamb has come. Welcome home. Let's pray. Lord, we enter this new year aware of a lot of needs, facing a lot of unknowns, with fears and anxieties, as Aaron mentioned, that we walk in here into this room with. And yet, Lord, we come expectantly. We come trusting you. We come list to hear your voice speak to us. We need life. Lord, we need afresh to be reminded of how gracious and how kind you are towards us. We need to be transformed in your presence. And Lord, we thank you that you are eager to do that in our midst. Lord, I, I pray. I pray right now for anyone particularly who's wondering if, if your grace can meet them in this area. Maybe this time they've broken, they've broken your law one too many times. They, they have an expectation that there's no hope for them anymore. But I pray right now that your Holy Spirit would be lifting their gaze to see this new covenant that was sealed with blood, this cup that's being offered to them to drink. His blood that was poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Lord, cause us to be a people who are eager to hear you speak. Who that is our greatest joy and, our, and, and the thing we look forward to the most and where we find our life. Not in all the other things, but in hearing you speak to us, Lord. So come and do that in our midst and change us. Bring us your joy even as we do. We love you, Lord Jesus. We look forward to this day when we will gather with all of God's people. In Jesus' name, amen.